You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone and welcome to a Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. And we're so glad you're watching a Bible Answer today. Please tell other people about this program and where you're able to view it. We have three gospel preachers with us to serve as panelists to answer your questions today. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. Hello, I'm Steve Sanders and I preach for the Donovan Church of Christ in Donovan, Missouri. Hello, I'm Brent Arnold and I'm the minister for the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee. And my name is Tim Howard. I'm the minister of the Sanford Church of Christ in the Missouri Boot Hill near the town of Steele. So glad each of these brethren could be with us today, taking time out of their schedules to answer your questions. Our first question goes to Brother Steve Sanders. The person asks, is the devil being referred to as Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 11 through 15? Brother Sanders. I would like to thank you for this question because I believe that this question not only is something that may fill a curiosity or in your mind or in the mind of others, but it also is an example of being able to go back in our Bible study and to consider context. Now many have thought through the years that, the, that Lucifer was the name of Satan. And, and that's the name that's given in the Bible because of Isaiah 14 and verse uh, 12. But they connect that with Luke 10, 18 when they do this. Now this is something that goes back to Tertullian. Tertullian did a, the main part of his work in the early part of the third century. It also goes back to Gregory the Great who did much of his work in the sixth century at, toward the end of the sixth century. And since that time, many people have picked up this idea that Lucifer referred to in Isaiah 14 is the same person as Satan in the Bible. Now, they've just, we have uh, come to just accept that connection as evidence that his name is Lucifer. But we need to keep something in mind. In the larger context, even in Isaiah, we find that this phrase, because this is based on a phrase in Luke 10, 18, about Jesus saying that he had seen Satan fall from heaven. And <clears throat> this is a, a common these are common words that are used with certain kinds of imagery. For example, in Isaiah 34, 4, Isaiah said, uh, or he speaks of the host of heaven falling down like a leaf falling from a tree or a fig falling to the ground. Even Jesus used th this imagery in Matthew 24, 29 when he spoke of the stars uh, falling from heaven. So we need to realize then that these words are actually very vivid imagery. Now let's look at the context of Luke 18:10 or 10:18 where Jesus said and uh, said I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now Jesus said this to the 70 disciples who had been sent out on the limited commission. They came back and they were excited about all of the great works that they had seen and they had been a part of. This was something that uh, actually showed the power of God and they were able to see that firsthand with their own eyes. They were able to be a part of that. And so in their excitement, Jesus made this statement about seeing Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Now, nowhere in this context of Luke 10 is Jesus talking about the origin of Satan, but rather he is talking about his defeat in this particular passage. So he's simply using this vivid imagery in order to explain the power of God and Satan's defeat. Now let's take a closer look at Isaiah 14 verses 11 through 15, the passage which is mentioned in our question. Isaiah said, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, the worms cover thee. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars uh, of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, granted, this passage, when you read about this, if you're thinking about Satan, then obviously it does fit. It is a fitting name, I suppose you could say, for Satan, considering his origin. And that gets into another question altogether. But in verse 4, if we look at the larger context, we find that Isaiah is obviously talking about the king of Babylon. And he mentions that in that context, in that passage. Therefore, when he speaks of Lucifer, this is who he's referring to primarily. Now, the Hebrew word here, Hillel, is actually a word that is not a proper name. But rather, this word means shining one. It refers to the brightest star of the morning. And so there's absolutely nothing in the context that connects this with Satan except the assumption that we make, that automatic connection, because it is uh, a striking resemblance to it. But once Tertullian and Gregory uh, planted this idea in the minds of people, uh, it was very easy for us to presume that it is Satan. And this is why I actually come to the conclusion that Lucifer is not necessarily a name of Satan. It is a fitting uh, description of, uh, of his attitude and of his fall, but it's not necessarily the name of Satan. It is actually the name or a description of the king of Babylon. Thank you very much. And now we have this question, and it came from uh, the same viewer. Why do we depict Satan in such comical terms as a man in a red suit with a pitchfork when he is actually the enemy of our souls? And we'll give that to you, Brother Arnold. Well, we should treat uh, our understanding uh, of Satan just as we would any other biblical subject. We want to approach this with a balanced mindset. And uh, on the one hand, we don't want to underestimate the ability of Satan to tempt us and to destroy our souls, but we also don't want to overestimate him either. We don't want to give him too much credit so, such that we would fear him to the point that we, we would be overcome. That would work into his favor uh, if we do that. We shouldn't underestimate his ability. He is uh, more subtle than, than any other tempter uh, could be. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8 that we should be sober and vigilant. We should be of sound mind and we should be watchful because our adversary, the devil, is walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Peter does not want us to underestimate the enemy who is looking to destroy our souls. When Jesus knew that he was to be tempted by the devil, the Bible says he prepared for that by fasting for 40 days. He did not underestimate the ability of the, the tempter that was to, to come against him. And if Jesus didn't underestimate his ability, then we certainly should not either. We think about when Jesus knew that, that Peter would be tempted by the devil. He, he told Peter, I have prayed for you, Peter, uh, because Satan has desired you that he may sift you as wheat. Luke uh, twenty two thirty one is a reference to that. And so he, didn't, he did not underestimate the devil. He didn't want Peter to underestimate the devil. Paul said in 2 Corinthians eleven three, 3, he says, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul was concerned about his brethren at Corinth. He knew what was at stake. He, didn't, he was afraid that they might be, um, they might be uh, 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 deceived by the subtlety uh, of the tempter. So all of these passages indicate we should never underestimate uh, Satan's ability. We should never be careless in putting ourselves in harm's way uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, putting ourselves in the opportunity where we can be tempted. But on the other hand, let's don't overestimate his ability. Let's don't exaggerate his power and his ability to tempt because then we might be overcome with fear and not resist. And the Bible does say that if we resist the devil, 
He will flee from us. That's James 4, verse 7. Uh, so we can resist him. And uh, also, we think about uh, Job as a great example of someone who resisted Satan. Satan appeared before God and asked for opportunity to, to throw everything he had at Job. And God allowed him certain uh, opportunities to tempt Job, but would not allow him to take his life. But even when Satan took away his possessions and took away his children and took away his health, the one thing he could not take away from Job was his faith. Job was able to resist everything that Satan brought against him. And even though Satan said that Job would curse God, in the end, Job blessed God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Joseph's another good example of someone who was tempted time after time after time by his brothers, by Potiphar's wife, by uh, the imprisonment that he endured. Uh, time after time he faced these temptations, but he was able to resist every time those temptations came. Jesus is another great example of someone who was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Ephesians 6 tells us if we arm ourselves with the whole armor of God, if we have filled our hearts and minds with the Word of God, and we are actively engaged in prayer, we have everything we need to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And God has promised that He will not allow us to be tempted above what we're able to bear in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So, uh, oftentimes we do see Satan depicted as a cartoon character and and, and, and in that way, maybe he doesn't seem as serious uh, as the Bible portrays him. Uh, let's take a balanced approach when we think about the devil. Let's don't underestimate his ability to tempt, but let's don't overestimate his ability either. Thank you for, so much for this question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. Our tract today is entitled, What Jesus Said About Divorce. If you'd like to have this free tract or our eight lesson Bible correspondence course, just contact us. You may do so by writing us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You can reach us by means of our contact page on our website, www.abibleanswertv.org. You can email us at abibleanswer at earthlink.net or you can call our toll free number, 1-800-436-436. 0463. Uh, please leave your address information in a good, clear voice, and we'll seek to meet your request. Now back to our questions today. To Brother Howard, the person says, People are always commenting that deceased loved ones are looking down from heaven watching over them. Is that true in light of Isaiah 65, 16 through 17? Brother Howard. Well, it may be a, a nice thought that our dearly departed loved ones are uh, watching over us. And that's a, that can be a comforting thought, I suppose. But nowhere in the Bible that I can find does it state or claim or even insinuate that the, our deceased loved ones are looking down on us uh, from heaven. Now, there are, other, are some countries, uh, South America, Mexico, that, that celebrate the, the Day of the Dead where loved ones attempt to communi commune with departed loved ones. Maybe that's where that idea came from. I'm not sure. But let's look at the, the passage before us and see if we can see what it says there. Isaiah 65, 16 and 17 says, So that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of truth. And he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hidden from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Well, in context there, we need to realize that the passage itself is about Israel. Brother Wayne Jackson put it this way, National Israel would come to an end. On the other hand, the true children of God, spiritual Israel, would be given another name, a new identity. In the New Testament, this is represented by the name Christian. The former difficulties, for example, the consequences that result from evil, will be forgotten and hidden from Jehovah's eyes. So the passage itself there in Isaiah has really nothing to do with the death of individuals, but the figurative death of a nation, which was Israel, and the birth of a new nation, which is the kingdom of Christ or the church. So the idea there, do deceased loved ones look down on us from heaven? 
Well, the Bible teaches that when we leave this world, we are no longer aware of what is going on. In 1 Samuel 28, verse 15, Saul, of course, is uh, going to, uh, to the witch of Endor, as it were, and, and Samuel is brought up from the grave. And says, Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? In other words, he, he doesn't know what's going on. Why, why are you doing this? Which is a whole interesting concept there. And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, does not answer me any more. Therefore I have called you that you may reveal to me what I should do. So Saul had to tell Samuel what was going on. He didn't know what was going on. Now, Samuel being a prophet... Uh, in the past life, apparently had, was given some insight into the future. The next couple of verses he said basically, uh, you, Saul, you and your sons are going to be with me tomorrow when the Philistines um, attack. And of course that's exactly what happened. In Ecclesiastes 9 verses 5 and 6, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. So again, we see that we don't know what is going on in this world. Actually, according to the Bible, when we die, we will not go immediately to heaven or hell, but to the Hedean realm, the, the realm of the dead. Uh, the realm of the dead, according to the Bible, is divided into two parts, paradise and torments. Now we learn this from the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. Now someone might say, well that was just a parable. Well, the thing about the parables of Jesus is that they either were true or could be true. Jesus never told a parable that was fantastic or, or fanciful and could not be true. And there's no reason for Him to uh, create something, to make up something about the, the life thereafter or the existence after death. And so in Luke 16, I uh, won't read all of this. Verse 23, And being in torments in Hades, he, the rich man, lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then verse 25, And Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot nor can those from here uh, there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Now the interesting thing is that according to this passage, the rich man did remember what was in this life. He remembered that he had five brothers who were at that point coming to the same place. But he had no knowledge, as far as real time, what was occurring uh, in this life. In Luke 23, we see both Jesus and the thief on the cross, and they were about to die. And they were about to enter the realm of the dead, or Hades. In Luke 23, verses 42 and 43, Then, then the thief said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. They would be in the Hadean realm, the realm of the dead. Again, where Lazarus was uh, there in the, in the parable that was given. And one final passage we'll look at is Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, the sermon that Peter preached. Verse 25, For David says concerning him uh, of Christ, verse 27, For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And then in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So, in conclusion, let's remember that the Lord is our shepherd, our advocate, our high priest, our mediator, and that he has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age, Matthew 28, verse 20. And I would submit that that is a better blessing 
than any loved one could be? Thank you for that great question. Thank you. Now to Brother Sanders. What happens when we die? Does our spirit leave our body? Does our spirit remain asleep until Christ comes again? We hear people about people dying and having out-of-body experiences and heading towards the light. What does the scriptures tell us? Well, there's a lot in those questions, but we'll give that to you, Brother Sanders. This is a, a question that shows the curiosity that I think most people have. It's hard to imagine someone not being curious about this question about what happens when we die. And so that's why I appreciate this question so much. And there are, I have uh, taken this apart into three different parts. So I'm going to deal with the first part to begin with. Death is a separation <clears throat> of the spirit from the body. We can go back to James 2.26 where James said, For as the body without the spirit is dead, even so faith without works, uh, or faith without works is dead also. Now the best example of what happens when we die is something that Brother Howard just mentioned, and that is Luke 16. And he did a wonderful job with this. It is uh, not just merely a parable. One, in, one thing I would add to that is that this is the only time, if it's a parable, it's the only time that Jesus ever used a proper name in, in a parable. <clears throat> but as he said, this is something that is going to be accurate or consistent with reality, with facts. And so then we find in Luke 16 concerning the rich man and Lazarus what happened when they died. Now in verse 22, Jesus said, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. I always find that an interesting uh, contrast here. How the, how the rich, well, Lazarus, the beggar, died and he was carried by angels to the bosom of Abraham. There's an interesting word study that can be done or there's a play on this where we find that, a, that Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham actually shows us that the needs that he did that were not being met in this life were being met after this life. But also he was taken by angels. What a comforting thought to those who are faithful in Christ Jesus when it's time to leave this world and leave this life behind and go on to an even greater life. On the other hand, it says the rich man died also and was buried. It's pretty abrupt and blunt, isn't it? There we find that the rich man died and this, there was nothing very special about it, but rather it sounds almost ominous and tragic. And we see that more when we find that the rich man was in that place of torment in the Hadean realm. And also <clears throat> Lazarus was in the uh, place of paradise in that Hadean realm. And <clears throat> that shows us that that's where we will be until the judgment. Now some people have asked this question, and I'll just throw this in, that if we know if we're going to be saved or lost before the judgment, why, are, why even have a judgment day? Well, the answer to that is, is the final judgment is really going to be more about sentencing than finding out if someone is saved or lost. You know, we can know that we are saved in this life before we die. 1 John 5.13 explains this. Not only that, a person can know they're lost as well. So uh, we find that that's what happens after death. As far as the sleeping part is concerned, uh, we have um, the we do s sleep, but that's accommodative language. We see in Daniel 12:2 and 1 Thessalonians 4:14 that it is described that way, but it does not mean that the spirit is sleeping. Concerning out-of-body experiences, I have had one, but uh, a similar or close to one at any rate, and that is something that the Bible does not address. Now, the National, uh, <clears throat> the National uh, Academy of Sciences says that when the heart stops, there is a flurry of electrical impulses in the brain, and that can cause people to see lights, things of that nature. But here's the thing that I think is most uh, important concerning this, is that there are nine 
different cases of people being raised from the dead recorded in the Bible. And in not one of them is anyone, uh, does anyone explain what happened after death or add anything different than what the Bible already teaches. Lazarus, when he was raised from the dead after being dead four days, did not add anything to that. He did not have anything to say about it. So as far as these things are concerned, we do have to be careful about uh, accepting that as gospel. We have the Word of God and we must always turn back, turn to it. Thank you for that question. Well, that was several different questions in one, wasn't it? But I thought Brother Sanders did a really good job in uh, answering that question, as did Brother Arnold and Brother Howard uh, for these questions that they've had today. We've had a number of good questions come in lately. We really appreciate uh, those of you who send them in uh, and keep doing that. Uh, we appreciate it very much. I wanted to make uh, the announcement that we do have a new supporting congregation of a, a Bible answer and that is the Kirksey Church of Christ in Kirksey, Kentucky, which is not too far from uh, where we're recording these programs. They are now a regular supporter of a Bible answer. And uh, sort of reaching a milestone, they are our 45th congregation uh, throughout this region that are supporting this program. And obviously without Without these congregations and their financial support, we cannot do uh, what we do. We cannot be where we are, and we could not broadcast in the areas in which we are. So we're thankful uh, to each of these congregations, all 45, for the financial support that they continue to give us, which allow us to be seen on various uh, stations, such as the Heartland CW, WQWQ, in Cape Girardeau and Paducah, Kentucky, and Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and then also on our CBS channel, WBBJ CBS, in Jackson, Tennessee, and WTWV, Good News TV, in uh, the Memphis TV area, and then also on the Gospel Broadcasting Network, which extends uh, around the world. And so we're thankful for the audience that this program has, and uh, as always, we're thankful for you for watching this program. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.